So we're really delighted to kick off our series uh, with Giselle Jeha and Catherine Vardy from the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. And they are going to do a session on uh, why intellectual property matters. So um, I think that this is a, a timely session given the current uh, economic circumstances and um, I know you're gonna enjoy it. So thanks again, everyone. And over to you, uh, Catherine and Giselle. Hi, thank you, Allison. Um, my name is Giselle Jeha. I'm an innovation offer, officer at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Catherine Vardy. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Um, who's uh, one of our intellectual property advisors representing the Atlantic region. Um, so I will actually go ahead and get started. So today um, we'll be speaking to you um, on behalf of, as I mentioned, Canadian Intellectual Property Office, otherwise known as CIPO. Um, and we'll be speaking today about the basics of intellectual property and why it matters. And throughout the presentation, um, as Allison mentioned, there is a chat feature, so that'll be monitored. So if you do have any questions, we'll try to uh, stop at the different sections um, and uh, get to your questions. And if not, at the end of the session, we're actually having a little time uh, allocated for some Q&A. So there will be time to uh, answer your questions then. So this is just an agenda of what we will be going over today. Um, so as part of this positive collaboration with the Women's Enterprise Organization of Canada, WIOC, um, we're happy to present this webinar on IP foundations um, to their clients, entrepreneurs, and other businesses that have joined us today as part of WIOC's learning sessions. Um, it's our goal today to give you the ability to recognize IP and equip yourselves to better understand how IP affects and can benefit your business. And with this webinar, we do have three goals. Um, we are, the number one is to explain what IP is and why it matters, to let you know the differences between different IP rights, and finally to provide you with uh, an introduction to IP strategy. And of course, at the end of the presentation, I'll go over a few of SIPO uh, resources and services that are available to everybody. So a little bit about ourselves. Um, SIPO is part of, of a government department known as Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada. Um, aside from administering IP rights, we also provide quasi-judicial uh, function for trademarks and patents, and we work to raise awareness for the effective use of IP. Um, our mandate is to deliver high quality and timely IP products and services to customers and increase awareness, knowledge, and effective use of IP by Canadians. Uh, one example is through these uh, webinars. We do focus on key growth industries, including advanced manufacturing, health, biosciences, digital technology, agri-food, and clean technology. So just to get through, much of the world's economy has shifted from an industrial economy to an idea economy. This means that much of the economy is based on ideas rather than tangible assets like factories and raw materials. In fact, based on different studies, over 90% of some companies Market value can come from intangible assets such as brands and the intelligent designs of hardware and apps in smartphones, new medicines, online platforms, and much more. So it's important to have an idea of what your IP is. Many discover that their business actually own IP, but they never actually realized it. For example, if your business has a name or a logo, these are valuable business assets worth protecting. In fact, relatively few Canadian companies hold formal IP, and only a fraction of these have a strategy for how to best to use it. Interestingly, those that have formal IP are the ones that experience higher growth and are more likely to export. 
So that was just sort of an introduction. Now I'll actually hand it over to uh, my colleague, Catherine, who will be going over uh, why IP matters and going over the different types of IP rights. Hi there. Um, thanks for participating today. And hello from Eastern Canada, where it's very windy. So hopefully there won't be too much uh, distracting noise from, from my end. Um, Thank you, Giselle and Allison, for the opportunity to, to join you today. As has been mentioned, we have IP around us everywhere. If you just stop and if you've got shoes or sandals on your feet, uh, the clothing you're wearing, do you have a beverage next to you, the, the cup, all of those things, what's in the cup? Is it Coca-Cola? Is it a cup of coffee? That's all forms of IP. And so, as was mentioned, a lot of people don't realize that IP is around you everywhere. And it doesn't have to be this kind of fuzzy, what is it really we're talking about? My goal is going to be, let's, let's make it real. The minute you have a business and you're offering a product or you're offering a service, you have intellectual property in some form or another. And why should you care about it? Well, if you're in business or planning to start a business, you don't want your competitors to be copying you or stepping on your toes. If you want to get funding for your, your business because you want to grow, as part of the financing, you may need to show that you've protected yourself. Any of you have watched Dragon's Den, the show, they'll get asked, what, what are you doing? Like what prevents somebody from copying this business idea? And what would you do? Who else is out there? And so it's a tool to help you achieve your business goals, secure your markets, and you build a reputation and goodwill with what belongs to you. What, what is your product or service and what makes you distinctive? Um, there's never one of any product. Why does somebody walk into Second Cup versus McDonald's versus Tim Hortons versus Starbucks for a coffee? Well, there's a reputation and goodwill and there's that that's branding and i'll talk about trademarks as as we get to that section next slide please so i like to think of intellectual property as a toolbox so if i was going to build a house i'd need different tools if i'm going to build a business i'm going to need different tools to protect what i have and so there are five main tools in our intellectual property toolkit, as I like to call them. Uh, some you may have heard of and be familiar with from previous uh, discussions or presentations, and some you may be less familiar with. A lot of times people think intellectual property is patents. And patenting is one of our tools, but there are a lot of other tools. There's trademarks, there's patents, there's industrial designs, which often get forgotten, but can be really powerful and very useful, depending what you're trying to protect. Copyright, which many people have heard of, and trade secrets, which some people may or may not be as familiar with. So my goal is we're going to walk through each of these tools and do a bit of an overview. What, what do each of these tools do? When do you use them? What do each of them help you protect? Next slide, please. <laughs> so sometimes a, a good starting point, because if you're not as familiar with the different tools, it can be a little bit overwhelming and it's easy to confuse, oh, well, is it a trademark I need or a patent? We have an IP inventory checklist, and this is one of um, the resources that I use a lot with, with clients and when I'm talking to folks, um, because you can go down the left-hand column and see what is it I have? Do I have a customer list? Do I have a domain name? Am I developing a mobile app? Do I have an algorithm? And then you can kind of go across and see, oh, well, what is the type of tool or intellectual property um, form that will help me to protect that? And what, what should I be considering? So this checklist is incredibly useful. There is a link to it in, in the presentation. And you can also, in any search engine, if you do CIPO, C-I-P-O, IP checklist, you'll, you'll come to it. There's lots of resources on our website. I do sympathize that sometimes it, it's tricky to find things 
Um, but often search engines are your friend. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about uh, how to get in touch with human beings who can help you with IP questions, because that's also part of my, my role and our role is to say, what is intellectual property and, and what are the resources and how do I get help when, when I have questions, whether that's today or a week from now when you think of an intellectual property question and you're like, oh yeah, I heard those, those two women talk to us about SIPO and maybe I can contact them to get answers to my questions. Next slide, please. So trademarks is, um, is the first tool that I'm gonna talk about. And I like having this as the first tool we talk about because virtually every single company, startup, business I talk to has a trademark. They have a business name and many, many of them also have a logo. So what a trademark is, is it's, it's a sign, whether that's the name, whether it's the symbol for the logo, the words, the colors. If I say zoom, zoom, or if I talk about uh, a swoosh, or if I describe a pink stuffed rabbit that's beating a drum and, and walking around in a circle, many of you are gonna know just by that verbal description what company or product I'm talking about. There's a perfect example of trademarks. So it's a, it acts as a sign that points to you as the source of that product or service. And the way those work is they're a mix of automatic that you use them, you get them out there, use it or lose it, and officially registering it. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. And if you register, it gives you the right to exclude others from using your mark. And I'd add something similar. I would not be able to open a coffee shop called Jim Hortons because that would be confusing to a consumer and that brand is protected. So it protects exactly what you've registered, but also it's a little bit broader than that. It's would a consumer be confused as to what is the source of that product or service? So if it's too similar, they would also have the right to exclude others from using exactly your mark and what you've registered and protected or something similar that would cause confusion. So that's a really good tool to use. And your protection would be valid in Canada if you register, you have to go country by country. So if I protect a trademark in Canada, but now all of a sudden I wanna start exporting to the US, I need to double check, has somebody registered that trademark in the US? So you have to go country by country for your protection. And I have unfortunately, had consultations with a small business that's been doing really well in Canada, wanted to expand to the US, had funding to go on an ACOA trade mission, ACOA being a, an economic development agency in Atlantic Canada, you have Western Dev or other equivalents across the country, and it's great, it's exciting, but nobody checked, could they use that business name, that product name, or that logo in the US, or did somebody beat them to it? and have re that registered already. So keep that in mind, that's an important principle. All these IP rights or intellectual property rights and tools are country by country. We represent the organization in Canada that registers them. In the US, it's the US Patent and Trademark Office covers some of it. So these rights are renewable. They're 10 year term for trademarks and they are renewable every 10 years. Trademarks are the only form of intellectual property, the only tool we have that you can renew indefinitely. Not all the others have an act now offer may be canceled anytime, it's time limited. Trademarks, if you think about big brands, um, Folgers Coffee, it's an American example, apologies, but a lot of the big brands, they've been around for more than 10 years. They renew those every 10 years to protect their brand in perpetuity and long term. And the difference between you'll often see a TM or the R in a circle. And that's a question I get asked a lot, which is a great question. What's the difference between the two? Well, TM is before you've registered. And R you get to use once you, you've registered with SIPO, if it's a Canadian 
uh, trademark or the US trademark office and be very careful in the US if you put that R in a circle without your official registration, you'll get your fingers slapped and you might get a fine. So, um, and in Canada, you shouldn't be doing it either. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that on the next slide. The difference between registering and, and not actually will be the slide after this one. So hold that thought. <laughs> Um, it's okay, we'll, we'll, I'll keep the order that we have. Um, so trademarks, the, the strongest trademarks are invented words. Before Kodak or Kleenex or Polaroid registered their trademark as a brand, those were not words you could look up in the dictionary. They didn't, they didn't exist. Those are often the best trademarks, the easiest to register um, and, and the most effective and easiest to defend uh, against somebody infringing or, or stepping on your toes. You can also sometimes use an existing word in an unusual context. So before Apple built a huge business on iPhones and iPads and all, the, all their products, we didn't think of the word Apple in association with computer or technology products. Or roots means the root of a tree, but is used to brand a clothing and purses and other you know, consumer products. So using a word in an unusual way also is a strong trademark and is normally fairly easy to register and you won't run into any roadblocks. You can also sometimes work around uh, to suggest something. So chapters for books, Whirlpool for washing machines, things like that. Um, personal names are not recommended. They're, they're difficult to get. Now, Tim Hortons is an exception, um, but if I, as Catherine Vardy, wanted to register a trademark with my name, I wouldn't have much success. Um, if, if you're curious, you can also look at, um, we see this a lot more in the US, but it, it spills into Canada. If you're Cher or Kylie, <laughs> Uh, Cher has made a case to trademark her name in the US uh, because if you're a, an actress, um, a movie star, a singer, you can make the claim that you are so well known, you are a brand. However, as an individual like myself or many of us, you won't be able to meet that bar of, of being able to brand yourself as a personal name. And a descriptive mark that that just describes what is your product or service is difficult to register. I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be more challenging. Next slide, please. So let's open a parentheses here on the TM versus the R, which is the and unregistered is TM versus registered. It's a little bit, I like to use the analogy, it's like common law marriage versus you're going to walk down the aisle and you're going to legally get married and have that certificate. If you move in common law or you launch a product, you have common law rights. You can put the TM on it. I could create a company, a product name, and as long as I'm not infringing on somebody else, today, tomorrow, I could put TM and I can launch my product. I don't have to register it with my colleagues in, in Gatineau, Quebec with the intellectual property office. However, those rights are more limited in the same way that if I just move in with somebody and I don't get legally married, I do have certain rights, but I don't have the same breadth of rights as if I was legally married. So the main thing to consider is your rights are limited within a certain geography. So if I, open or if I open a business or launch a product and I put TM and I'm in Vancouver or Edmonton or Perry Sound or Halifax or Nain Labrador, I'm gonna be limited as to how broadly I can enforce that common law trademark because it's not registered. Somebody else in another part of the country or the next province over could make a case, also launch common law, 
and we'd really have to battle it out and nothing against lawyers. I work with a number of lawyers and they're wonderful people, but they are the ones who are going to make the money when it gets snarly and you have to tease it all out. <laughs> if you do register it with um, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, that's the stake in the ground. This is mine. It's being granted to me. And the legalities of proving that ownership are just a lot easier. And then your rights are sound all across Canada. It doesn't matter if I'm in Halifax and I've registered a Greek restaurant called Opa. Somebody else in Calgary, if they want to open an, a, a restaurant called Opa, they have to get permission from me. We actually have a case uh, where it's the reverse has happened. Calgary did have a restaurant that registered OPA and we had re a, a series of restaurants here on the East Coast that had to rename and rebrand because they were violating a registered existing trademark. They didn't know to check the data bank. I think I already mentioned uh, if you're going to export, you need to look up that trademark in another country, wherever you're planning to export to. Uh, and use your uh, trademarks consistently. And if you're going to use them long term, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense to register them. Just because you buy or pay for the internet domain name, it doesn't mean you've got a trademark. So maybe that domain name is available. But if you don't go ch check the trademark data bank, you might buy a domain name that somebody else owns the trademark for. Not, not to say that it's common, but it can certainly happen. And sometimes people will register a trademark or buy a domain name and hang on to it, hoping to sell it to somebody else. So I did mention uh, conducting a preliminary search. These are not secret databases that you do not have access to. I don't have superpowers um, and, and secret passwords that give me access to something you don't. I use exactly the same public Canadian intellectual property trademark database. And if you're going to go broader, I always recommend uh, the WIPO global brand database. It's fairly intuitive to use. Anybody can access these. If you don't know how and where to find those, get in touch with somebody from our office, whether that's me, another intellectual property advisor, or our customer service folks. Uh, we'll be giving you that contact information later. And you can put a registration in online. Legally, you can register your own trademark in Canada. So you can go online and do it yourself. We do suggest and recommend you work with an agent uh, just because there's a couple of technicalities and I certainly for Atlantic Canada say, if you're gonna do it yourself, please reach out to me first um, because I'm at least at a minimum gonna give you some tips and tricks to hopefully make it a little uh, less complicated for you. Um, but if you've got a complicated trademark to register, we really do recommend that you, you work with, with an agent because there can be a lot of pitfalls when you're doing those. Next slide, please. Actually, I will just ask, do we, did we have any burning questions on trademarks that, um, okay, I'm just looking. So is registration for a name the same as a trademark? Uh, no, registering your company name, either provincially or with the registry of joint stocks, does not give you a trademark. The two are separate processes. So, um, you, you need to know the difference uh, between the two and check both places. Just because, I like to say, just because you register your business name, that does not give you the automatic right to put that sign facing the street or that logo or brand on a package that's, that a, a consumer is going to buy. I'll give you an example. There's a company registration called Doctors Associated Incorporated. That's not the sign that faces the street. The sign that faces the street is a chain of restaurants called Subway. So the two are different. Subway is a trademark. Doctors Associated Incorporated is the business name. Actually, they may have amalgamated and have a different name now, but you get the idea. 
Um, I see also if somebody else gets your name and you've used it for decades, would it not be considered identity theft? Well, somewhat, because if you've only got the common law rights, you've, um, if it's common law, you will get the right to continue to use it in your geographical area. There was actually a case in the US with McDonald's. The, the original people who started the first McDonald's hamburger stand continued to have the right to operate that one little hamburger stand as a mom and pop. Um, and if you watch the movie about McDonald's, you can see how it became the big corporation, but they split from the original founders. Uh, if you've registered that trademark uh, with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll open a, hopefully a quick parenthesis. It gets advertised. Before my colleagues say, yes, we are going to give you that trademark Canada-wide to the exclusion of everybody else, it gets advertised. And there is a two-month window where if you've been using that common law and you hear that somebody else is applying, it's a speak now or forever hold your peace, more or less. That's, that's how I kind of describe it. So um, there, there is a mechanism and I'd be happy to revisit that later if somebody has more in-depth questions. And in terms of cost, uh, it's, it's an it depends, but I'll give you a range because it depends is not helpful as an answer. It's about $400 if you file yourself. With an agent, you're looking at $1,200 to $2,000. They'll do a full thorough search. They'll do all the due diligence. They'll make sure that the scope of what you're protecting and the fence around what you want to protect with your trademark is appropriately worded, is broad or narrow enough, and really does represent what it is you're trying to protect. And we could do a whole hour on trademarks. I think I'm going to leave it at that and move on. Uh, but if there are burning questions about trademark afterwards, um, I'll do one other quick one because it's a it's very uh, relevant. How long does it take? Right now, we are backlogged. I will not lie. You're looking at about two years from start to finish. But its first to file is the is the principal. Uh, helps. So the, the, the sooner you file, the better to start the process. Okay, now I really will move on to patents because I don't want to get get us uh, too far delayed. So a patent is a tool to prevent others from copying an invention. And it gives you the right to exclude others from making exactly the same thing in the same way, using that technology or or methodology or selling or even importing. So if I have a Canadian patent uh, for a type of clamp, somebody else can't go get the exactly that clamp made in China and import them into Canada. You get 20 years of protection from the date you file and it is first to file. It is not who was the first person to invent it, it's who was the first person to file to protect. However, in exchange for that protection, you have to fully disclose and explain how is this made, how does it work, all the details. So, so that's important to bear in mind, and I'll revisit that later on when I'm talking about another tool. We do have what's called, um, not legally, the oops factor. It's a 12 month grace period because you need to file your patent before you launch and re release your product. Or if you're, in a, if you're dealing with a, a university and something was developed at a lab and they want to call, form a spinoff, if they went to a conference or a trade show and released it, publicly disclosed it, uh, then you are in Canada you have the right up to 12 months afterwards to go, oops, I really should have filed a patent and I didn't to get it in. Not all countries give you that, that leeway. So that's important to know. Next slide, please. So what can you get a patent for? A uh, common thing I get asked is what about a recipe? Yeah, recipes are pretty tough. If you've got a very specific, sophisticated process, or methodology, so more in an industrial setting, 
Yes, that can be patentable. A machine and how that machine works. A manufactured good, something that's not easily, if you can't reverse engineer it easily, um, that could qualify. And if you could reverse engineer it, but it can't be obvious to somebody else skilled in the art. So if I'm an electrical engineer and I'm trying to get a patent for something that is obvious to all other electrical engineers, it won't go through. It, it won't be appro approved. It can also be for composition of matter. It can be drugs, for example, um, or any combination of these things. And nowadays with so many products around us and, and processes, very few are completely novel applications. 90% of what we're seeing are improvements to something that exists already. Next slide, please. So here again, it's really important to do a preliminary search. So let's say I'm sitting, you know, in my office or nowadays it's more by a Zoom call. I'm talking to a new client who wants some help with what they feel is their intellectual property. And the first thing is going to be, let's conduct a preliminary search or they, they need to get someone, usually a patent agent, to do a thorough search. Are they infringing on something that's already been protected? And so that's a really important first step with, um, with something that you have. You have to also name and give credit to all your co-inventors. And you have to fully explain how your, your invention is made, how it works, how it operates. It's not about, is it faster? Is it cheaper? What are the business benefits? It's how does it work? And I, I think I already mentioned it's first to file. And I would strongly, strongly, strongly consider using a patent agent. So I've been an IP advisor for a little over five years now. I have met one company where they are filing all their own patents. They have a really, really clever person on staff who has the perfect mindset to do this well. But I would say that 99% of all of the clients I work with, this is not a do-it-yourself, self-serve type of option. Patents are incredibly complicated. And we really recommend that you get professional advice. The difference between a patent agent and a patent lawyer is a patent agent had to write an exam and is certified by us. So they're accredited. Um, but they can't take someone to court. A patent lawyer has not only written the exam to be a patent agent and understands patents, but is also a lawyer, so can take someone to court for infringement. So the question I get asked is, who should I go to? Well, if you're doing a, a preliminary search or applying for a patent, an agent is going to be cheaper and you don't need them usually to go to court. So you don't necessarily need to, to hire a lawyer to do a good patent search and, and to help you put together a, a patent application. Um, yeah, so let's go to the next slide. And because I'll probably get asked how much does a patent cost and how long does it take? Very good questions. Length of time, Absolute minimum is one to two years, really two, and it can be as long as five years. And to give you a range of costs, honestly, I don't think you're going to get a patent for cheaper than ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and it can go up to a hundred thousand dollars plus. It depends what you're patenting. If it's a if it's a an engineering invention, not that that's more straightforward. Obviously, that's going to be cheaper. If you're patenting a drug we may be talking, you know, five, six figures, um, and, and those are multinationals. So it's kind of hard to say, um, but, but depending on your invention, you sometimes can get a patent for 15 to 25,000, um, but that's spread over a number of years. So it's not like you have to pay all that money up front. Plus, if you've started the patenting process, that's often very interesting to your investors and they're going to want to see that what you've got is protected, especially if it's something that can be reverse engineered and copied. 
So keep that in mind. So trade secrets um, are a little bit, I wouldn't say the opposite of a patent, but in some ways. In, because you fully disclose with a patent, you do the opposite for a trade secret. A trade secret, you have to keep something secret. Back in the day when WD-40 came up with their formula, when Coca-Cola came up with their recipe, they probably could have gotten a patent for it, but they didn't. They chose to keep it as a trade secret, which you do not register with, with us, with SIPO or with anybody. You keep it a secret. And the reason they probably took that strategy is remember, patents are good for 20 years and then it's, and then it's laid open and anybody can copy it. So what you've described, your product, how to make it, all the details, in a patent, everybody can see it. And after 20 years, everybody can copy it. That's how you get generic drugs. The drug company patents, they have the exclusivity for 20 years, but after 20 years, it's fair game. Trade secret is the opposite. They've never shared it. They've kept it a secret so nobody can copy it. So WD-40, if they had patented it, after 20 years, everybody would know exactly what their formula was, how they made it. Instead, they did a trade secret and it's not registered and they have to keep it confidential. I have heard, can't tell you if it's true or not, but I'm assuming it is, that the, the, the recipe for Coca-Cola is in a vault and it's under lock and key. Very few people have access to it. And the few people who know about it are not allowed to like travel together to conferences and they put all these things in place to protect that secret. So these are legal tools that you use, you encrypt things, you keep it a secret, you make sure your employees know this is proprietary to you and your business. This becomes important because apps and a lot of computer software-ish based companies now are using trade secrets as a protection tool. So I just wanted to highlight that. Next slide, please. So I think I just mentioned, you wanna restrict that information. Um, you wanna store them in a secure location. Now WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization has launched a new tool called WIPO Proof. And it's a digital time date stamp that gets attached to an electronic document to prove it existed and it was yours at a specific time. Some people are starting to use that for both copyright or instead of copyright, which I'll talk about shortly, and for trade secrets. Encryption, password protection, make sure that if you have to, if you're talking to investors, future partners, your company is growing, that you are getting them to sign non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements, people working with you, whether employees or contractors are aware this is proprietary to you and your business. It is important that they keep this a secret and not share it. Otherwise, they're in breach of that contract. Next slide, please. So I mentioned copyright and we, we think of copyright for a novel, a movie, um, maybe a series on Netflix or something like that. But believe it or not, it also applies to the content of your website. And software code is considered a literary work. So again, this, this comes up a lot because many, many of the folks I'm talking to who are starting businesses and startups are, are creating apps, are creating software. And so there are a number of copyright type issues around software code. Um, but in a word, copyright gives you the permission or the right to copy someone else's work if you've gotten permission. If you haven't, you're, you're in breach of copyright. Um, and, and we've all seen, you know, piracy is not a victimless crime, right? That little thing that, or Interpol will get you, as I like to say, in, uh, on, are the notices on various things that, that we use every day. Um, so copyright is automatic upon creation. If you register it though, you do get a certificate of ownership. So if you've created an app 
and I get it, your code's going to maybe change and it's constantly going to be tweaked. But at certain points, you may want to either register and get a certificate of ownership for a snapshot of what you had created at a given time, or use this WIPO proof stamp. Um, registration for copyright's about 50 bucks. And uh, the WIPO proof of ownership is, is depends on the exchange rate is, is 40 to 60 Canadian dollars as well. And, and it's like an electronic stamp on a on an electronic document. And the copyright protection is the life of the creator plus 50 years. And the Berne Convention, which was an international agreement signed by many countries and has well over 100 countries, all recognize copyright pretty well by the same rules. So not all of these tools in our toolbox have exactly the same rules in every country. That's something to be aware of. As, as a worldwide system, now that we're global, every country runs its own IP system. With these agreements internationally, we're trying to standardize as much as we can so that the rules aren't wildly different from one country to the next. Um, but that's also why it's really good to talk to somebody knowledgeable about intellectual property the minute your product or service is going beyond Canada to be aware of what's happening. I was on a, a webinar this morning with Gowlings, one of the law firms, talking about trademarks in China versus the EU versus Canada versus the US, what are some of the things to be aware of? And so I, I can be the repository of some of that knowledge to give some people tips and tricks on what, what to watch for before you go to have an appointment with, with a, a lawyer or an agent. We try to, I'd say the best way to explain my role and, and what we do as intellectual property advisors is we book one-on-ones uh, with business entrepreneurs and inventors, and we try to prep you to, max, to be knowledgeable about the tools and to maximize your time with the experts. So at least you don't go in cold and use up your dollars with them explaining to you what's the difference between a trademark and a patent, and what are some of the things you might want to consider or watch for from a business perspective. There's business decisions to be made. Those are absolutely yours to, to decide. Um, but we want to make sure you have the base and the understanding when you go in. Next slide, please. So just because you're the first author, you're not necessarily the copyright owner. If you think about musicians, they've often signed, you know, uh, an agreement with uh, maybe Warner Music or Sony Music or a smaller company. Same thing with an author of a book. Maybe they're represented by a publishing company. Uh, and, and they require licensing or assignment or agreements to use some of that work. So we hear a lot in the music industry of cases where it's really important who gets to use your work. And it's, it's coming up a little bit again now in the news. Musicians who are unhappy with certain politicians who use their music in association with a, a certain political campaign. And maybe that artist really doesn't want to be affiliated with that po politician. They have the right to say, cease and desist and do not use my music. And I'm hearing that with the US election, and I've also been hearing and seeing examples of that for Canada as well. So you have to be careful about inv avoiding infringement. And the other question I often get asked about copyright is, well, if I change it 20%, I'm not violating copyright. So I'm gonna, I don't know if this will come through sound wise, but if I go, that's not 20%. If I use that in a song, the person who has that in their song is probably, and actually it's the music company who owns the rights to that song, they're probably begun, gonna come in after me. And some of the starting riffs of Beatles songs are so well known that two to three notes are protected. So there is no 20% rule, there's no 10% rule, it's distinctiveness and that is determined in a court of law. So disputes around 
IP that has been registered, for the most part, we go to case law uh, to see what were the precedents and they're decided by lawyers. There is no IP police. My colleagues in Gatineau will not be the one pursuing infringers. Um, but your ability to say this was mine and here's my proof is much greater if you've registered it because then you've got something concrete to show that it's yours. So we recommend people put a copyright notice on, on everything that you've created. That includes your website. Who was the owner or the author and the year and the copyright symbol of the year it was created. So I see I'm in the arts. What is the rules on creative process? For example, a quilt pattern. Yeah, uh, the whole, uh, listen, I'm a quilter and active in the arts community as well. A, a quilt pattern, as the creator, you do get to put the copyright, but it's, it's tricky and challenging to prove who came up with it. Because if somebody, you can have, parallel invention or creation, um, I would say keep your working notes and be familiar with who's doing what. And unfortunately, when you get into an actual debate or argument or, or dispute over copyright, the interpretation of that does absolutely end up in a court of law, which I sympathize folks um, who are, you know, craftspeople professionally often don't have the resources. I will say that there are a couple of national organizations for craftspeople and for artists that have legal funds to help resolve some of those disputes. If there's something specific, um, I'd be happy to talk about that later or um, give you my email and you could reach out to me. I work a lot with craftspeople uh, in Atlantic Canada. Next slide, please. So uh, one of our last tools is industrial designs, which I feel is kind of the, the, the country mouse or, or forgotten cousin of the intellectual property tools. It protects the unique shape, pattern, ornamentation of a product. So I'll give you an example. Chances are, I'd, I'm going out on a limb here, but I don't think too wildly. We're all, we all use toilet paper, right? The pattern that's stamped on your toilet paper or your paper towel is probably protected by an industrial design. The little flowers around a chinette paper plate are distinctive to that brand and are protected by an industrial design. Uh, some tartans are protected by industrial designs, uh, in addition to being registered with the tartan registry in Scotland. I've had questions about this and I did a whole half day of research because somebody had IP questions on that. Um, so they're the shape of things, the visual appearance. Uh, we see it for jewelry. We see it for sunglasses and certain designer goods. It could be the shape of a chair, though that's very difficult to prove that it's distinctive and nobody else has ever come up with a chair that's that shape before. Um, and as things expand in, in global marketplaces, it's becoming more and more difficult to have something that is so new and so inventive that it's not already out there, but, but people are still meeting that standard and that bar. So you can register that in Canada. Once again, it gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling a product that has exactly that shape. And it gives you up to 15 years from when you file. And again, you want to preferably file before you launch that product. So if you become well-known enough for the shape of your product, the Coca-Cola bottle, the Gatorade bottle, um, the honey that you can buy in a squeeze bottle that's shaped like a teddy bear with the nozzle coming out of its head. <laughs> Those then, they started many of them as industrial designs. And once the 15 years was coming up, 
they then applied for a trademark to say there's a form of trademark called the distinguishing guys and they said we're recognized now by the shape we want to transfer that into a trademark the kit kat bar with the four rectangles you break apart started as an industrial design there are industrial design registrations for the shape of chocolate bars and if they become well known enough they can then um, if they achieve notoriety and recognition, they can then be continued into protection with trademarks, which remember, they're the only form you can continuously renew afterwards. So it's another tool and with craftspeople actually, uh, there are examples of, of folks who use industrial designs to protect artwork and, and creative um, craft products. Next slide, please. So one of the tips is, again, you need to do a search. It has to be new um, and not exist out there already for you to qualify. I just mentioned the distinguishing guys ahead of time so that if you're recognized and when you register, you actually submit either photographs or drawing that show what it is you're protecting from different angles. Now, if it was uh, we were talking about quilting. If I designed a, a fabric design, so the stripes, maybe the stripes on my shirt, or it was a floral design, or, you know, in the, in the quilting fabric world, there are people who have very distinctive styles uh, for, for their designs. That would be a, a flat image, but those would be protected uh, by an industrial design. Mary Mecco, a Scandinavian designer, is recognizable when you see big 1960s type of flowers on those fabrics. They're recognizable as, as hers and her designs. Charlie Harper has uh, birds and, and the style of his birds. And it, you could say for greeting cards or you know any other very distinctive patterning could be protected with an industrial design. Next. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to pass it back over to uh, sorry, pass it back over to Giselle to talk about how do you put all these things together and come up with a strategy to use them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'll actually just go over this section is on IP strategy. Um, we actually do offer, SIPA offers an in-depth webinar. Um, so just an hour talking about IP strategy on its own. Uh, so I think the goal here is just to introduce the uh, the topic. And then if you do have any questions, um, you can always get in contact with one of our IP advisors or um, also tune into one of our recorded webinars on IP strategy, which has goes into much more uh, detail than I will today. Um, so a strategy, I guess, simply put, it's um, it's a plan to manage your IP assets. Um, and the goal of your plan is to understand your business model and how IP fits into that model. So having an IP strategy that dovetails with your overall business uh, plan adds a level of rigor to defining the path you'll take um, and using IP to achieve those goals. It's essentially a plan to get the most out of your IP, um, including establishing ownership uh, of the inventions um, that you have and giving you a competitive advantage over, um, over others. Um, within this IP strategy as well, um, you'll use it to identify your IP strengths, what sets you apart uh, from others and uh, essentially how you're going to succeed. Uh, within the IP strategy, you'll also prioritize what makes financial sense to protect first. Um, as Catherine mentioned, uh, going through the IP rights, uh, depending on what you are looking to register, there's costs associated with everything. Um, and some of these costs can be quite substantial. Um, so that will be a very large part of your IP strategy is prioritizing your IP assets and um, what you should protect first, uh, according to what your budget is.
So planning for success, um, this is what we use our IP strategy for. Um, so an IP strategy can be focused on one single IP asset, or it can be used um, to cover a mix of many. Um, so patent, it can include patents, trademarks, copyright um, for the same invention. And usually the most successful strategies actually contain more than one of these, um, these IP rights. So at the bottom of this slide, you'll see um, a six step process. So this method methodology is just uh, one suggested example of how to build an IP strategy. And this is sort of the six step guide that we provide um, within our IP strategy webinar. Uh, so today I'll just introduce it, but again, um, we do go into it in quite detail into the webinar. So I do advise you guys to go check that out or to consult with an IP advisor on these. Uh, so let's look at the first step, an internal IP audit. Um, as mentioned before, many businesses do have IP, they just don't realize it. Um, so whether it's a logo, a packaging slip, uh, sorry, packaging slogan, a website, um, all which can be um, formally protected with IP. Um, so the best thing to do is to start by creating an, uh, an IP inventory uh, checklist. And uh, Catherine actually at the beginning of the, uh, the, the webinar uh, showed just a screenshot of one of our tools in our CPOS toolbox uh, called the IP inventory checklist. And that's sort of just to help guide you to know what IP you have um, and how it can be, how you can go about protecting it. So again, another good place to start is just basically make a list of what you own. Uh, two, external IP audit. Um, so before you dream big, verify that you have, what you have is really yours so that you own it and you have the rights to use it. Um, these can, this can easily be done again by doing a, a search, um, and Catherine mentioned some of the, uh, IP databases that we can, you can search. Um, again, we do suggest doing a preliminary search yourselves beforehand, and we do have our IP advisors that can help guide you through this and which databases to look. Um, again, this is just a preliminary step. Um, there And then there are IP agents, IP lawyers that can you would seek to help you do a more comprehensive uh, search um, just to make sure that you're not uh, infringing on anybody's IP rights. Uh, number three, analyze. Uh, so make sure your plans and IP protection are heading in the same direction. So file for IP protection before you share any critical information. Uh, this is if you attend a conference and you create uh, posters, um, their speeches, and you disclose any information, that could be putting your application at risk because you've now disclosed um, this uh, information before you've actually filed. And now let's go next to creating your plan. So when building the plan, you want to make sure that you plan for what IP protection you need, when you need it, and where you need it. Uh, five, implement. Uh, know how to protect and use IP no matter the situation. So know how to talk about IP online and at different events. So know what to say at these conferences. Um, say what it does, what your invention does. Don't necessarily say how you did it. Again, that's you're disclosing. Uh, confidential information and ensure that you have confidential confidentiality agreements in place before speaking to partners um, or employees that you have within your company. Make sure all of those uh, non-disclosure agreements are put in place before disclosing any information. And lastly, you want to reassess and uh, realign your IP strategy continuously. Uh, think of it as a living document. Um, you can set targets uh, for your business, you will have business goals and targets, and you're working towards those. Uh, but again, things constantly change. So remember that with things change, priorities also shift. So every now and then you have to go in, check back uh, with your IP strategy, make sure everything um, is still on target. If you need to realign, do that then. And um, 
there is IP data that is online uh, for free that's available. And there is lots of help um, as well through SIPO services, such as our IP advisors and our client service center. So the customer uh, service support is a very good uh, first call or email uh, to make uh, if you're unsure about how to go about this. Um, and even if you call them, they can always redirect you uh, to one of our IP advisors for some of more of those uh, detailed questions. Uh, but IP strategy, just stressing that it is uh, a very important uh, step in protecting your IP rights, managing your IP rights. Um, and in order to be successful, uh, most companies, um, well, it's, it's recommended and will we'll have an IP strategy in place. Uh, just going to look quickly at a few uh, statistics for everybody. Um, what the statistics show here is that sometimes small and medium enterprises often lack uh, the advisory and financial resources available that some of the larger firms have. And so therefore are sometimes less likely to acquire formal IP rights. Um, but SMEs are getting better at this and are filing. Um, so a survey conducted here that we're showing in 2017 found that larger SMEs uh, were more likely than smaller businesses to innovate and hold formal IP. Uh, the survey also found that SMEs that hold formal IP are four times more likely to export, two times more likely to be high growth, and 27% more likely to seek financing. Um, the graph on the right, um, I won't uh, go into all of it, but just let's take a look at patents. You'll see that 59% of uh, businesses, small, medium enterprises are at least slightly aware of patents. However, out of those, only 2% actually hold at least uh, hold formal IP. So it is quite different in terms of the awareness versus actually holding a patent. Um, and now I'll just go through a few possible IP strategies that different uh, businesses uh, can take. Again, just remember that not one size does not fit all. Um, so these can be used um, individually, combination of, and not, not even hybrid, like sometimes it will fall outside of this list. So by no means is this a, an exhaustive list. Um, the first one, do not file any IP pr uh, protection. Um, this works, this strategy works well um, if your strategy is first to market. Uh, so for instance, when Catherine was talking about uh, trade secrets, so again, uh, with this strategy, you don't file uh, anything and it's actually kept as a trade secret. And here you're working on getting your invention out as quickly as possible. Um, and you're going to rely on uh, the, building the brand loyalty and customer base. The second one, pre protecting technical aspects. Here you're seeking patent protection on the technical aspects of your invention, um, and it'll help increase your ability to shut out competitors. Uh, focusing on brand value, well, it, it's just like it says, uh, you're seeking here a trademark or a copyright uh, protection. And this will help to protect the value that is built through brand recognition of your product. Combination of IP rights. Um, again, mentioned this a couple of times. Most of them are not, you're not just going to be uh, filing a patent. You might have a, a trademark, a patent, um, you know, copyright for the one product. Um, so this is using a combination of IP rights. It will depend again on your budget. Um, and how you prioritize um, what you have. Uh, filing protection for offensive purposes. So in this strategy, you aggressively enforce rights against competitors in order to exclude competitors uh, from the market. Um, as opposed to the defensive, pur uh, defensive purposes filing, you hear you're not necessarily obtaining a, pat a patent protection um, to assert or enforce these negative rights, but really you just have them, you have your rights as a deterrent 
um, to competitors who may feel that you are infringing or you're using it to block out competitors out of the market. So again, these are just a, a few different strategies uh, that we actually do speak more to in our IP strategy webinar and by no means not exhaustive. Uh, Catherine also mentioned this uh, a few times. Um, I just wanted to put in this slide just to introduce the idea that remember um, IP is territorial. So again, SIPO represents um, IP rights here in Canada, um, but depending on where you go in uh, the world, you will have to seek protection in that country. So it is country to country. Um, so for instance, if you're thinking of doing business abroad, a few things uh, that you need to consider, your target market, market conditions, local partners. Um, so for instance, you'll start by thinking about the market potential of your target market. Uh, if you've been successful in marketing it in a certain product domestically, there's a good chance that that product will also be successful um, on a global scale. Again, it's going to be dependent on market conditions and the realities that exist in that market. All things that will have to be um, looked at before you actually um, export or start um, uh, doing business abroad in that country. Um, because what might work also here in Canada might not work in France. Um, so you'll need to know if your product or business are subject to any regulations. And if at some point you'll need to rely on local partners, which is, a, again, it's mentioned on the screen. That's also very big as well. Very important um, that using here an IP agent or an IP lawyer uh, does not mean that you may need to uh, connect with local partners in the country you're going to be doing business with. So, for example, also hiring an IP lawyer um, in Mexico um, that would work uh, alongside the one here in Canada. Um, to learn more about doing business abroad, uh, we do have um, a webinar as well um, that will provide more detailed information. And we do have lots of resources on doing business abroad. Uh, for example, SIPO offers guides on different countries um, that are available on SIPO's website under our IP toolbox um, under the section doing business abroad, and we do have them per country. Um, again, every country has different regulations. So uh, we provided their sort of a high level guide uh, just to get you started. But again, those are just a start. Um, if you do have more detailed questions, you'll have to um, speak to an IP advisor who will then uh, can guide you who else to contact after them. And as I've been mentioning, um, know what you don't know, then seek help. Uh, meaning after you're doing your pre preliminary research, um, it is recommended you do contact uh, an IP professional, an IP agent or an IP lawyer. Catherine did go through uh, the differences um, on for these three. Um, there is a link provided on this slide where you can find registered IP agents um that that's not the only place you can find them but uh again um these are professionals that can help you develop your ip strategy and take the next steps in your ip journey um so start with the basics um i would recommend contacting SIPO, um customer support and then speaking with an ip advisor um and then once you're at that stage um, they can recommend that you seek uh, help from one of these uh, three or another, um, another individual. Cost is, um, there is a cost associated. Again, Ka Catherine mentioned that as well. Um, but again, it's important to remember that um, the amount of time you, you spent on developing whatever the invention is that you developed your product, you've invested so much time, uh, resources, financial resources. So um, it is some, you know, it is worth um, also making sure you get the correct uh, advice on how to protect and manage 
that IP asset um, because there are a lot of pitfalls that you can encounter in this IP journey. Um, so we just want to make sure that uh, you do you are guided uh, correctly, and uh, we want to provide you with as many resources as possible. Uh, speaking of resources, so we do have SIPO does offer several on their website. We have created an IP and awareness education program um, that is available at uh, canada.ca slash IP for business. Um, our IP awareness and education program is split up into three pillars. Um, the first is IP for business. Uh, within this uh, pillar, we, have, we provide access to several IP resources. Um, this is our toolbox of resources, including fact sheets, guides. Um, there's a tech transfer toolkit that is coming. We have roadmaps on patents, trademarks, uh, and the other IP rights. So really we are providing as much information we can to guide um, uh, SMEs on their IP journey. Um, again, these are all, uh, like mo mostly paper-based, but they're available online. Um, but a lot of them are fact sheets and uh, guides. The second one um, we call IP Academy. And this one is for in-person and online uh, learning events. So for instance, these webinars that are provided, um, the in-person uh, seminars that our IP advisor advisors host, uh, the one-on-one -on -one sessions that they provide. Um, there's case studies that are, um, again, provided. Um, success stories are part of this. We have a lot of uh, e-learning modules that have been developed um, that cover the basics of IP. And for those, those are actually available on our website 24-7. So those can be done at any time and on your schedule. Um, and it's sort of like a mini learning course. Um, and there is... Uh, right now a module for each uh, patent right. So those are good to check out as well as you can log in and log off. Again, pick up where you left off at whatever time you can. And the third pillar is very important. It's speak with an IP expert. So here um, we provide two uh, contacts, mainly the client service center, which is like our customer support and uh, the IP advisors as Catherine, um, right now our speaker, who is responsible for the Atlantic region. So we do have IP advisors located uh, throughout the country, coast to coast. And just to introduce you to them virtually, <laughs> these are our IP advisors um, and you'll see the regions that uh, they cover. On our website, you can under contact us, you'll actually be able to find uh, this same uh, graph and their contact information. So if you do have a question, their email is posted there um, and you can contact them directly. And just sometimes it is, uh, people are a bit unsure as to who to contact first at SIPO, whether it's our client service center um, or an IP advisor. Um, so again, once you visit these, uh, this website, we do have a small description, uh, kind of, of who, co who covers what and who to call upon, um, the client service center, you're looking for, uh, more general information on IP. Um, if you're looking for, um, questions about, uh, our website, the app application status, the filing process, um, they can kind of, they guide you on that. IP advisors can provide uh, more uh, in-depth um, in depth information on, for instance, uh, developing an IP strategy, um, provide um, examples um, of whatever your product is and um, what, how best to protect it or how to go about that. And uh, for any reason, if you are still unsure, um, we work as a team, so, whether you contact the client service center first um, or an IP advisor, they both can refer that person to each other. So it wouldn't be a problem contacting the client service center. They can always get in, put you in touch with the correct IP advisor to answer your question. Um, and then from there, um, the IP advisors usually set up one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, uh, and so really dedicate that time 
um, to their clients and to help them um, in their IP journey. Um, this is just our contact page. Uh, you'll see there's the phone number for the Client Service Center. As I mentioned, the IP advisor's contact information is on our website and it is posted for every uh, individual IP advisor by region. So depending on where you are uh, in the country, you can always contact the appropriate IP advisor. And so that concludes the presentation. Um, at this time, I just wanted to open it up um, if anybody has any other questions for Catherine and I. And I'll just put back the, uh, the contact page for people to have. I'm just going through the chat now. Yeah, I think we we mostly covered off what was in in the chat, but if people have questions and want to just, you know, take take themselves off mute, um, True. and and continue the discussion where we're here for a bit longer, so don't don't be shy. <laughs> I'm going to just jump in here um, in case anybody uh, needs to step away, but I just wanted to thank you both, Catherine and Giselle. It was a tremendous uh, session and so insightful. And I noticed uh, uh, a few comments on, on the chat section about uh, how great this was to fill in gaps in knowledge. And I know it's a, a pretty intense area uh, of expertise, but you've really um, delivered in a, in a very accessible way. So thank you very much to both of you uh, for being here with us this afternoon. It was just a, a tremendous presentation. Um, I'm going to mute off and uh, encourage anybody with any questions to, to jump on and to uh, connect with Giselle and Catherine. Um, we have a few more minutes allocated for this. It looks like about, I'm sorry, I was looking at the time, about eight minutes. So um, uh, please take advantage of their expertise if you're able to stay. Thanks again. I'm... I'll, I'll fill a, a wee bit of airtime just to say, so what I do as an IP advisor, I would say is really two main things. Um, I give presentations like this, and I'm fond of saying all the forms of IP are represented by beer, coffee, or chocolate. Unfortunately, with COVID, I don't get to go out in person because when I present in person, I usually bring chocolate or candies to, to the presentations, which is, which is fun. Um, so that's, that's obviously part of my role. My, my goal and all of us who are in this role across the country, we try to raise the awareness and education level so you understand what is intellectual property and hopefully it feels a little less confusing and scary. And then the other part of my role is for me, and I would think most of my colleagues is the same. If you send us an email because you'd like to book a consultation, those are free. That's my job. Um, I normally, for myself, I book a one hour time slot um, and I can do them by phone. I personally, and as an employee, don't have access to Zoom. But if you do and you would prefer to do it via Zoom, that's great. And usually what that involves is we just book a time slot and have a chat. And I say, tell me about you know, what it is you're working on. Maybe you directly have some IP questions. I'll do my best to answer. Um, I am not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV and I can't give you legal advice, but, um, but I can at least help say, okay, well, if you're about to launch product X or you're, you wanna do this, here from my perspective and my area of knowledge, here are some of the things to consider and, and that you might want to look into going forward. Or I might just say, you know what, that's a great question. That's a legal question. You need, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You actually really need a lawyer for this or an IP agent to, to get the proper advice. But we can do some of the preliminary spade work together to figure out where might you go next and what, what might you consider. At the end of the day, these are IP tools 
But I think I alluded to this earlier, it's a business decision. It's not my job to force you to register a trademark. I can't decide if going through the process of patenting meshes with your business strategy. I mean, when we talked to uh, Giselle, sorry, talked about uh, st IP strategy, you can decide to be defensive, you can decide to be offensive. Maybe you don't have the money to patent it. Maybe you're working on a social enterprise and you want everybody to access this. Maybe you've come up with a new way to treat uh, potable drinking water. And you don't want any big corporation to be able to corner the market with that technique. Well, guess what? If you share it and it's openly available to the world, nobody can patent it. That's a strategy. So these are the kind of discussions we can have um, and it's going to depend. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a business decision. Do you want to get a patent, prevent everybody else from using this, and your goal is to make a million dollars? Or is your goal to run a social enterprise? There's no right or wrong answer. And you know what? I can't answer that for you. But I can. we can sit and chat and say, well, what are the tools? And if you use this tool in this way, or you do this with these tools, here are going to be the consequences and how things could roll out. And so it's really a brainstorming session to, to figure out what are some of your choices and how, and then you get to decide what makes sense for you to go ahead. So I just wanted to, hopefully, maybe that explains a little bit more what it is we do as IP advisors and, and how that fits with your business planning and protecting what you have as you move forward. That's a great overview, Catherine. Thanks so much. And it also um, helps to demystify the process a bit and know that there's resources out there so that um, you can sort of enter into this a little bit cautiously uh, before spending a lot of money, which I'm, is, is a concern for, <laughs> for most people, right? And, and uh, you know. Yeah, the analogy I'd, I'd like to use is if you need a will, some of us are at that stage in, in life and um, you can sit in a lawyer's office and try to figure out what you need to put in a will and who's going to take care of your kids and do you have a house and all that. Or you can arrive with a draft of a will and say, I think I've covered off what I need. What have I missed? Is this valid for my province? Is this valid for Canada? Is this valid for the country I'm going to? That would be the analogy I use. I'm very cautious about people who, you know, download something from online, whether that's a non-disclosure agreement or a contract or what have you. Get it checked by a lawyer, but at least arrive to the lawyer's office prepared with examples and knowing a little bit about what it is you're hoping to achieve with this. So you're hiring your first employee. You want to make sure you own the IP. Well, what do you need? Well, right? Those types of things. So going in prepared, I, th I think makes such a huge difference. And that can save you money. Maybe you're only paying for half an hour to an hour of lawyer's time. While otherwise, if you went in unprepared, it would be costing you for two, three hours, because you didn't give them a draft, you came in with nothing. And they spent the first 45 minutes telling you what, what a trademark is and why you might need one, because what you're trying to protect is fill in the blank, that logo, that what have you, right? So by all means, and I just want to put a shout out there for partners, um, organizations like yourselves, and I partner and I could not do my job as well as I do. I hope I do it well, <laughs> um, without the help of all sorts of partners, because as you saw with the map of Canada, we're a small but mighty team. So the fact that you're meeting with clients and people who may not be aware that I exist and Alexis is in Waterloo and Ryan is in Vancouver. And so referrals for me anyway are huge and just wonderful and help me accomplish my goals, which is to hopefully give people access to what they need and help them as best I can. So thank you for everybody who helps us do our jobs well. And if you're part of a team or know others that are part of a team where we do kind of train the trainers. So I work with economic development, ACOA folks. I work with 
Nova Scotia Business Inc. I work with Canada Business and my local folks for Canada Business, other federal, provincial, municipal agencies who are out there working with entrepreneurs. And so those links and connections are incredibly helpful and valuable. And I think they're all win-win. The more we can help our entrepreneurs and business folks get ahead, the better off it is for, we are for everybody. So thanks for helping us as well. Well, thank you again, Catherine and Giselle, and thanks to everybody for being here with us today. Uh, that brings us to 2.30 and um, we will sign off and look forward to seeing you at our next session, uh, which takes place in October. October, I think um, somebody sent me a note, but we'll confirm that. And uh, thanks again. Uh, see you soon. Stay Thank well. You. Thank Stay you. Up,